the way back to your seats. <clears throat> We're going to continue the five-part series that we began last Sunday out of the book of Jude as we prepare ourselves for the year 2016 as a church. Children's Church, ages four through second grade. If you would like, if you're visiting with us, you have a child that age or you have a child nursery age that would like to go, they're welcome to go. <clears throat> but they're also welcome to stay in here too, so whatever you'd like to do. Either way, they're through that door over there for someone else that would like to, to go and be a part of that. We're in the book of Jude again this morning. Last week we dealt with the first uh, <clears throat> four points of that, uh, of that message, contending for the faith. You'll notice on the marquee outside that our title for the message today is Identifying False Teachers. And hopefully by the end of the evening service tonight, we will have identified them. And next Sunday morning, very clearly, very clearly, Jude gives us, out of that short, short book in the Bible, Directions for Clear Creek Baptist Church for 2016. Very clearly uh, written out, delineated for us so that we know what God expects out of us for the year of 2016. So I'm excited about next Sunday morning, but we're going to have to get through this Sunday morning, this Sunday, and then next Sunday morning we'll see what God, the word that God has for Clear Creek Baptist Church for 2016. The overall theme of this short book in the Bible, in my opinion, uh, and of course the series title is Contending for the Faith, <clears throat> because Jude, when he started writing the letter, those of you that are not here last Sunday, when Jude started writing the letter, he said, I really, really, really wanted to write you something encouraging about our faith about the, the, the faith and the, that we have and the confidence we have in Jesus Christ. But he said, I was basically compelled by the Spirit to write to you something that you really need to hear. You guys need to tighten up on it a little bit. You're not contending for the faith like you ought to. And that's what this book is about. And how appropriate it is at the, at the introduction to the book of Revelation. It just starts as it prepares us as a church and as individuals to endure these last days and to serve God faithfully through these last times. Now, the overall theme, in my opinion, is this. <clears throat> to me, this, is, this succinctly uh, states what Jude's about. Standing up for what is right, identifying and dealing with false teachers. To me, that's the theme of the entire book. Standing up for what is right and identifying uh, and dealing with false teachers. And this is probably... In my opinion, one of the most relevant books in the Bible for the church today. Uh, that This book, uh, and I, the Lord's led me to break it down into seven points that will give us uh, seven uh, different instructions as we end, uh, as we have end 2015 and start into 2016. Number one, we dealt with last Sunday. Uh, the first point that, that the Lord's led us to on this study is the importance of maintaining the purity of the gospel. And as I said already, it was so important to, to Jude that he forewent what he wanted to do and wrote what he felt like God would have him to do, which is what I think that we as a church need today here, guys, is to get our mess together so we can do what God wants us to do as we move into the end, as we move into the end of times today as a church. So then secondly, we talked about, and we talked about the reason that that uh, Luke felt like it was so important that we maintain the purity of the gospel and why we were not maintaining the purity of the gospel anymore in our families, in our church. And it was because the infiltration of sin uh, into our lives and into our churches, and that's what keeps us from maintaining the purity of the gospel. Then secondly, we talked about the infiltration of the polluters of the gospel, those people that were coming in that were polluting the gospel. And Luke said they're already here. Peter says they're already here. It's interesting how... Parallel Peter and Jude are to their philosophy and their theology and their teaching about the end of times and what the church is supposed to do. And then the third point that we dealt with last, uh, last Sunday uh, was the illustrations of God's judgment. As Jude, as Jude began to teach the church and, and teaching us today, he says, I just want you to know how seriously God takes it when God says, Thou shalt not. I want you to understand how serious that is in God's sight. And, and, and there through verse, in verses 5 through 7, he gives us three illustrations of God's judgment, what God really felt like about people that sinned. He talks about the nation of Israel, so does Peter in his writing. He talks about the angels uh, that left their first estate, uh, that left their first position, their assigned position of God. 
He talks about them as an illustration. God took those angels and He bound them in chains under darkness until the day of judgment. They're there today, this morning, right here. You're sitting here. They're bound in chains in darkness, waiting until the great white throne judgment, the day of judgment, when God purifies all the sin and evil out of this world, cast it into the lake of fire. We'll never have to deal with it again. Amen. Won't that be great? Amen. Praise God. Amen. But they're there this morning. And then he gives us another one, an illustration of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what and how God dealt with that. You think homosexuality is okay? Read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You think we need to tolerate that? Read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God shows you clearly how he Amen. feels about these issues that we deal with today. And then we deaf point number four was the was the ignorance, and we started there last week, the ignorance of false teachers and leaders. <clears throat> and we dealt, we dealt with the first part of that. We weren't able to get to all of that, but we dealt with the first part of it, and we dealt with the people to avoid. And in verse 8 through 10, he gives us a list of folks that we're to avoid. Now, you notice as we go through this thing, we're getting close to what we're going to deal with tonight is the, is the how, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But he gives us the people to avoid in verses 8 through 10. He lists those for you. We won't reread it. I've read it for you already. And, and, and then he gives us three deadly tendencies that these people that we, to, that we are to avoid, that they possess. And number one was jealousy. They walk in the way of Cain. Number two was greed, the heir of Balaam. You know, I want, I want, I want to possess things. I want stuff. I mean, I want big boy toys. You know, and, and that was Balaam's error. And, and then thirdly, the gainsaying of glory, where they, uh, and that was Korah, uh, where God, uh, he chose, he said, I'm just as righteous as you, Moses. Why are you, why are you the one that gets to carry around a stick and tell everybody what to do? You know, I'm, I'm as good as you are. So a couple of, 250 of them decided they going to fill up their censers. And Moses told me, just go fill your censers and come on out and let's see what happens. And you know how that story went, you know. They decided that they were self-righteous enough to do anything that they wanted to do that they felt like was in keeping with the things that went on in God's Word. You know, they chose for themselves their position instead of what God had chosen. He had honored them. They were all Levites already. They were servants in the house of God, and they wanted to step up a notch. And God said, okay, just bring, or Moses said, okay, tell them just fill their censures up and come on out in front of the tent in the morning and we'll see what's going on. So they all fill their censers up. They put strange fire in it. They step out in front of the tent in the morning. Fire comes out from God out of the temple, out of the temple, and consumes them. Nothing left but ashes, man. I mean, God takes this mess serious, guys. And this is not a mess of God's philosophy. This is this is how it works. So self righteousness. No, you're not good enough to do anything for God. You're blessed and honored to be able to do anything that God's given you the privilege to do. You better do it and do it the best you can. Amen. Don't try to do what somebody else is doing. You just do what God's given you to do. If He'd wanted you, if He'd wanted you to pastor a church of twenty thousand people, He'd have made you smart enough. You're just do that to do that. That's why you're pastoring Clear Creek Baptist Church instead. I'm talking about me now, okay? I'm doing what God wants me to do. This is what God's called me to do. This is what God's equipped me to do. This is what I'm capable of doing. You may not think so. It doesn't matter. God does. So I'm here, okay? I'm doing what God's called me to do. You do what God's called you to do, and don't think you're so good you can do something else that somebody else can do, okay? Good for that. That's a good little preacher sermon we get to preachers when we get to much of you preachers in here. All right, now, then, these people adjust the laws of God. So we finished up there last Sunday evening. Now, <clears throat> this morning, we're getting to the third to the third point. Yeah, the five illustrations of their characteristics. And this is probably, just this one screen is probably all we're going to deal with today because we have so many things to do today as we finish up this service. And I really want to call you to a, a level of commitment that you've not made before, most of you here. So I'm just going to deal with this screen today, and then we're going to make an application. Uh, I'm going to issue a commitment, uh, uh, invitation to you. I don't like challenges. I don't like to use the word challenge. Uh, to me, that uh, speaks of fighting. You know, if somebody challenges me, I'll just jump right in the middle of it. But if I'm invited to participate in something, that's a pleasant thing. So I'm going to invite you to a level of commitment that most of you have never made in your lives before. Uh, and I'm going to do that this morning. I'm going to tell you why now. But let's go through this screen right here first. These are, uh, and God's beginning to get to the point now in the writing of Jude that He's going to give us, and tonight, tonight we'll be able... Don't get ahead of me, but tonight we'll be able <clears throat> to identify clearly those people that may come into our church and some that are in our church already that think they are so blessed holy that really need to be slapped up the side of the head. 
And God's going to do that for you tonight. Isn't that great? Isn't that encouraging? Get to come to church tonight and he's right up to the side of the head. That's usual friendly, ain't it? I mean, I want to be there tonight. I want to be a part of that. You know, so that, it's interesting tonight when you don't, don't read ahead of me, you're cheating. So you don't read ahead of me. Don't you dare get in the Bible today, you stinkers, you. Well, because tonight we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get, we're going to get to you now. But anyhow, let's do this screen screen today, and uh, then we'll get it. Five illustrations of their characteristics. Or, really, these are five things that they can be compared to <coughs> in, a, in an earthly, uh, in a, on an earthly level, so we can kind of understand what they're like. So let's look at verse 12 this morning, and I'll be reading, uh, I'll be reading out of the King James, I'll be working out of two translations, but I'll be reading our text out of the King James this morning. No, let me read it out of the let me read it out of the ESV and then work on work work through it out of the King James. If that's all right with everyone, if anybody has any problem with that, I apologize in advance. But let me read it here. We'll start with verse 12 uh, in the ESV. And it talks about what these people are. And we're talking about the characteristics that I've listed on the board for you, or Greg's listed on the board for you. Uh, <clears throat> verse 12, these are, now he's talking about the false teachers and leaders. And remember this. The title of the message on the marquee is How to Identify False Teachers and Leaders. Okay, verse 12. Uh, these are hidden reefs at your feast. Now, what he's doing, look at me again. What he's doing is giving us some earthly illustrations to kind of help us understand what these people do, what they are, what they're about. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, these are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. These are, I'm adding, these are shepherds feeding themselves. These are waterless clouds that are swept along by winds. These are fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wow. These are wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. These are, and I'm, asked, and I'm adding these are to each one of these, these are wandering stars, for whom the utter darkness has been <clears throat> reserved forever. So I'm just going to deal with those two uh, verses this morning as we go uh, through that thing. So number one it says, it says that these are spots. Uh, the Greek word is application. The implication is reefs, and I love the ESV because it says <clears throat> that these are hidden reefs, and what it is, it's a picturing them as something just under the surface. The surface looks okay, but just under the surface, there's something that if you run into it, it's going to hurt you. Have you ever been playing in the ocean and uh, do something dumb and get hit on a rock or a reef or something other that's hidden under the water? I had that happen to me uh, one time. Uh, and, and everything looked fine. I mean, the waves were just rolling. It was pretty out there and everything. And I was out there acting a fool. I was in Liberia. I was taking a little break from an intense mission project that we had been working up in the rainforest area. And, uh, and, and that's a bunch of people out there swimming. See, the thing about it was, the people that were, that were out there swimming, they knew. Oh, stupid here. The only guy in the crowd that skin was white didn't know squat, so I just got out there in the middle of them, and I discovered that just under the surface there were some sharp, sharp reefs. I discovered them. I discovered them, yeah. This is what he says these people are like. There are things that just under the surface, they look like they're okay. And tonight you're going to understand this more clearly when it says they're just under the surface, but man, they can turn up jack. Now they can really mess up some things. Their spots, their, their immoral conduct makes them like treacherous reefs on which their fellows are made shipwreck. And then he said, and this, by the way, and he says they're, they're, they're attending, they're at the feast. And this... This love feast, and this will help number two to make more sense. This love feast was, was where they all get it. It wasn't communion. It was, a, it was a celebration of love. That's why they call it the agape or the love feast. It was a celebration of the love of Christ. And everybody came, the poor people and the rich people alike, they all came and they all ate and they were fed and they were blessed. These people, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. These people would be the first ones in line at the buffet, bless Pete, and they'd get all they could hold on their plate, and then they'd go back again, and they had no consideration for anybody else who was there, and while the feast was going on, they run their mouth, they dominated the conversation in the whole place, everybody knew they were there, 
They were just the most unpleasant people in the world, but they appeared to be the most righteous. Oh, you ought to hear them talk about how righteous they are. So here they are. They're underneath the surface. They appear to be part of the organization, appear to be part of what God's doing, but they're really tearing up some people, especially, listen, especially, listen, especially the poor people that didn't have any money, that couldn't bring anything to the feast to start with. So they're like hidden reefs, he says. They're rocks, they're spots. You know what a spot is? If you don't, when you get to be my age, you get them on the back of your hand, okay? <laughs> they're spotless, they're blemish. There's something that's wrong there. Number two, he says, that they're feeding themselves. Humphrey says, Humphrey says that they are like shepherds that have themselves for flocks, feeding themselves, not their sheep, with no regard or fear of the chief, she of the chief shepherd. They serve their own ends and their own needs. What a paradox. What an oxymoron. A shepherd that instead of taking care of his sheep and feeding the sheep, he's taking care of himself and he's stuffing his face. You understand? I'm telling you, and, 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 and this is an illustration for me. So if you're likely to you see a shepherd out here in the field and, and all the sheep are just wandering around, the wolves are chasing them, they don't have anything to eat. The shepherd's laying over there with a big 24-inch uh, 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 pizza supreme just stuffing his face, you know, and breadsticks and marinara dip and all kinds of stuff. Just having that big old... 36 to 2 liter Pepsi on the side. I mean, and he did having him a time the sheep's going in the pot. He said, that's what they're like. He said, that's what these teachers are like. And then, thirdly, he says, <clears throat> consequently, because of this, because there's spots on the feast, because they're feeding themselves, they're like waterless clouds, he says. <clears throat> waterless clouds. Go ahead. Thank you, Gary. Go get me a bottle of water or something. <clears throat> that's what you get for staying up all night. I'm chasing your wife. <clears throat> We're in the hospital, by the way. Waterless clouds. He says they're waterless clouds. Now, what is what 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 what's he talking about here? What's a cloud supposed to do? It's supposed to carry water. And it's supposed to refresh the earth. So it says they're like clouds that don't have any water. In fact, if you have a cloud and it doesn't produce any water, it actually it actually shields out the sunshine from you too. Wouldn't you like to see a little sunshine? I mean, I love storms and rain, but man, I'm ready for some sunshine. I don't know about you. Got up this morning, going to the hospital. Guess what? Clouds all over the blessed place. I looked at my, I pulled my, I pulled my weather, I pulled my weather station out. I looked at my weather station. It says supposed to be sunshine. Liar, liar, liar. I looked at the other weather station. It's supposed to be sunshine. Supposed to have sunshine until 12 o'clock today. Both of them lie me like a dog. Okay, you can't depend on anyone anymore. You know. Okay. So it kept the sunshine out. So not only not only do they not help, they don't have any rain in. They don't, not only do they not help, they prevent other blessings from coming in. You see, you see the picture he's painting of these false teachers and false leaders. And he says not only that, they're like uh, waterless clouds and they're like fruitless fruitless trees in the fall. What kind of tree is supposed to have fruit on it in the fall? Nothing except the old persimmon tree, you know. I mean, it's not for fall and frost till they get where they won't turn your mouth on so that when you eat one of them. Get rid of raw persimmon, you know. But, but, but what he's saying is they didn't bear anything to start with, and here it is. That's why he says they're twice dead. They didn't bear anything to start with. Here it's fall. They still haven't borne anything. They're worthless and they'd be uprooted and burnt. So the they're worthless, he says. So they're not any benefit. They're not any benefit to anybody. And by the way, he says, they have no capacity to be of any benefit to anybody. And then he says, number four, they're like wild waves, as the waves that make, as the waves foam up, so they make evil their shameful deeds <clears throat> and the things that they do. Isaiah 57 and 20 says this. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt. you see the picture? Ever been down to the ocean when there's really a storm and the waves were rolling and you watch the dirt, you watch the water begin to turn brown at the seashore and then it gets brown further out and further out and the more the storm is and the more the winds blow and the more the waves roll and the big old highways, it gets dark brown and dirty and dirty further and further out. And sometimes it'll go almost to the horizon if the storm lasts long enough. It's doing nothing. It's doing nothing but smothering the fish to death, dirtying up the water. You can't swim in. It's just, it makes a mess. That's what he says they do. What a picture he's painting of false teachers and false leaders. All they produce is trouble. And finally, he says, they're like wandering stars. <clears throat> now, there are two possibilities here. Theologically speaking, uh, 
I think there's two possibilities. First of all, you know what uh, uh, the mariners used to use when they navigated across the ocean, don't you? What did they use? Stars. They used the stars. Why? Because they stayed put. They were in place. It was a consistent that they could, what did they call those little machines? Sexton or? Yeah, something other. What was that? Is that the right word? Sexton. That they could look at the North Star, whatever it was, and triangulate, and they could tell basically where they were and what direction they wanted. And, and, this, and, and Jude says, these folks are like stars that don't stay in place. You can't depend on them. They're not going to be there. You can't triangulate nothing off of their location, man. And then the other option is this, a comet. Because he says darkness, the, the, the darkness is reserved for them. You know, so a comet, here it goes to burning through the sky. Man, it's making a blaze. Everybody sees it. Boy, what a look. Me and Barbara and the granddaughter, if you follow us on Facebook, you saw the last meteorite shower. We were out on the back deck wrapped up in blankets watching the meteorite. Where were they going? No blessed where they were burning out, but boy, they made a pretty show, didn't they? And that's what he's talking about. They just make a pretty show. They're headed nowhere. They're burning out. They're not going to benefit anybody. They're worthless except for them own self, their own selves and their glory. Wow. Kind of like that song, Long Black Train. Yeah. Their only destination is the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that's where they're headed. You notice they're unsaved. You know, they're spots on the feast. So those are the five illustrations or characteristics or comparisons that we can compare them to. So now, as I finish this thing up this morning, I want you to think about the Apostle Paul. Does this, is this not an apt description of the Apostle Paul before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus? He was, he was religious. He was devout. He was determined. He was loved. They all knew him. I mean, he was there, boy. God couldn't live without him. He's going to destroy everybody that was trying to hurt God. Let me tell you something. God's probably pretty capable of taking care of himself. He doesn't really need you to do that. He needs your loyalty, your praise, your honor, and your glory to him. God's pretty good at taking care of himself, and you can depend on him to do that. But here they were, and here they are. The Apostle Paul just fits these things to a T, and I'm not talking ugly about Paul, but I'm worse than he was. But you see, you know his life, and you've already studied it, so what an illustration of that. So, church, with this said, some of you may have seen yourself in some of these. Wow. Ooh. That wouldn't be good, would it? Hey, you could see some of yourself in some of these because none of us are perfect, are we? we? We haven't attained to perfection yet. So some of these traits have a tendency to pop up in our lives and in our attitudes and in our work. So as we get ready to start in to 2016, I want you to think about what should we be because of this? Now, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to ask Barbara to come and get ready to play in the ladies' book because we're going to have communion directly and we're going to have a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about blood and we're going to do a whole bunch of things this morning. But I want you to think this morning about what we should do in light of what we are facing and the possibilities that we're dealing with in this world and what God wants to do in our church in 2016. Now, January of 1981, God had called me to pastor this little old church, my first church up in the mountains. Started in January 1980 and uh, just had a, a great, great group of people. Uh, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them, maybe 30 people. Often run about $150, a, $200 a week, something like that. Uh, and God began to do a work there. And uh, January of, of 1981, I made this proposition to the folks in the church. I said, now every one of you, and I'm, and I'm, I'm making you the same proposition this morning. Every one of you that will, now listen to me. Every one of you that will make a commitment that by the help of the Lord, can you do it yourself, by the help of the Lord, you're going to either, number one, win someone to the Lord this coming year, in the year 2016. Some of you in here have never won anyone to the Lord. You've never led anyone in the sinner's prayer. 
You say, well, I'm planting some seed. If you plant enough, bless God, you're going to reap something sometime. I'm telling you. You can excuse not winning anybody by being a seed planter. But by the way, the guy that plants the seed is the same guy that runs the harvest machine at the end of the year. You notice these guys out here in the field? Start of the season, they run through the field with the machine, they plant seed. End of the season, they run through the machine with the field. Same guy on the tractor. Run through the field and they harvest, don't they? By God's grace, in the year 2016, I'm going to win someone to the Lord. Number two. By God's grace, in the year 2000, so I ain't going to look. We'll sit on your old duff and dry up and shrivel up and we'll have your funeral when you die and meet you in glory. Number two, by God's grace, I'm going to influence a family. I'm going to be free in the family and I'm going to lead them into Clear Creek Baptist Church. We had 32 people that January that came forward that Sunday morning. 30, just 32 people. Well, that's about everybody, wasn't it? But anyhow, they came forward and they made a commitment. That commitment, by God's grace, I'm going to win somebody to the Lord this year. Can't do it myself, but Lord, I'm going to do it. I'm, 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 I'm available. Number two, by God's grace, I'm going to befriend it family and get them into the church. December 1982. Guess how many additions we had to the church? 32. 32. Lying and lying. We had 32. She won't lie. I'll stretch the truth. You know, <laughs> 32 people committed in January. When we fill out the associational letter at the end of the year, we'd have 32 additions to that church. Pert near double that church in here. Okay, this morning, I'm asking you folks here this morning to make the 